Hear these words from the book of Genesis. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. And God saw that the earth was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted its ways upon the earth. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. Now I'm going to destroy them along with the earth. Make yourself an ark of Cyprus. Make rooms in the ark. Cover it inside and out with pitch. This is how you are to make it. The length of the ark, 300 cubits, its width, 50 cubits, its height, 30 cubits. Make a roof for the ark. Finish it to a cubit above. Put the door of the ark in its side. Make it with lower, second, and third decks. For my part, I'm going to bring a flood of waters on the earth to destroy from under heaven all flesh in which is the breath of life. Everything that is on the earth shall die, but I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall come into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. And of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of them, every kind, into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female, of the birds according to their kinds and of the animals according to their kinds, of every creeping thing of the ground according to its kind. Two of every kind shall come in to you to keep them alive. Also take with you every kind of food that is eaten and store it up, and it shall serve as food for you and for them. Noah did this. He did all that God commanded him. Then the Lord said to Noah, go into the ark, you and all your household, for I have seen that you alone are righteous before me in this generation. The flood came, and it subsides. And the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of humankind, for the inclination of the human heart is evil from youth, nor will I ever again destroy every living creature as I have done. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, as for me, I am establishing my covenant with you and your descendants after you and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the domestic animals, and every animal of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark. I establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the clouds and shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that it is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh, and the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on earth. God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I've established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. Thanks be to God. Amen.
I wonder what you have just heard. During the reading of those Hebrew scriptures, I wonder what you heard. What did you hear? Did you hear, did you hear Sunday school children singing, singing about animals going in two by two? Or did you hear children screaming, panic? Stricken, terrified, gasping for breath, people fleeing to higher ground, pleading, praying to be let into that ark, and if not me, then take my child, knocking, banging, Hanging on the ark, banging, banging, let me in. And yet the doors of the ark remained sadistically closed. What did you feel when those words were, were read? Did you feel the desperation, the despair, the drowning, the death? And then after the 40 days, what did you see? The sunshine? Green, lush, beautiful, blossoming birds and bees? or decomposing bodies, swelling, smelling, disease, decay, gathered in every single nook and cranny. The cruel result, the inevitable cruel result of dividing up a world with the simplistic notion that there are some who are wicked and others who are righteous, that there are two types of people in the world, good and bad. And if we can just get rid of the bad people, then we'll have peace. There's an axis of evil in the world. And if we can just destroy the axis of evil, then all will be safe and secure. The persons who act on this notion of dividing the world into wicked people and righteous people should be brought before the International Court of Justice for crimes against humanity and all of creation, even if that person is God. This deathly division between good people and bad people continues today, especially in my faith tradition, especially in my faith tradition, the Christian faith. 
The Christian faith, more than any other faith, has participated in this deathly division, dividing the world into good and bad, saved and unsaved. Those who will be ushered into heaven and those who will be cast into hell, that thought process is nothing more, nothing more than hate speech. We go back to the text. These Hebrew narrators were incredibly courageous. Risky in the extreme. You see, what these Hebrew narratives are, narrators are trying to do is not endorse this primitive partisan God or worldview, but rather to cleverly and with great risk subvert it. They knew that the common world understanding of God was that God was some almighty superhero that would punish the wicked and bless the righteous. They knew that that was the dominant religious worldview and understanding of their time. And so they risk casting God in that light in their narrative. They don't believe it. They know that's not so, but they cleverly start where the audience is. There were righteous ones, just a few. God saved them and the wicked were punished and the audience applauded because that was their worldview. Justice has been done, the wicked got what they deserved and the righteous what was promised. And then the narrator moves to act two. And we read that once the flood had subsided, wickedness remained. Wickedness remained. In other words, God failed. God failed to eradicate evil through through this weapon of mass destruction called the flood. The narrator is bold to pen those words, God failed. God fails when God uses violence. Not even God can use violence successfully. Not even God. God's war on terror became a war of terror. And God repents. Listen to these words. I will never again destroy every living creature as I have done. And then God is converted. And God takes God's bow, not a rainbow, but a weapon, God's bow, and hangs it up in the sky just as a boxer hangs up his gloves and says, never again will I fight. It's the great narrative of the disarmament of God. God can do all things. God can do all things except use violence successfully. And you and I will not be converted to nonviolence until we first realize that God has long since been converted. 
It is impossible to be a peacemaker if we serve a violent God, an angry God, a God who needs blood to be satisfied. If the God we serve, if the God we worship has blood on his hands, I use that male pronoun deliberately, then the likelihood will be that we will too. Using violence, God fails. And so how much more will we fail if we use it? And you and I witness the failure of violence all around us, all the time. Violence fails to deliver on what it promises, peace and security. Since 9-11, billions and billions and billions and billions of your dollars have been invested in violence, military might, and this country is less safe than it ever was. Doesn't matter how long you have to stand in line to wait to get onto an airplane. It's less safe, less secure. And if it's not more afraid, it is definitely more feared. Ask the people of Pakistan who scan the skies for drones. Where the people who fly them can have breakfast in the morning with their family. Go to the office and sit in a comfortable chair. And go to war in Afghanistan. Then they can come home for lunch and have lunch with their family. And then in the afternoon, they can go to war in Pakistan. There is no victory in vengeance. Satan cannot cast out Satan. Violence cannot cast out violence. War is a poor chisel to carve out a peaceable future, says Martin Luther King. And yet it remains our biggest investment. Now, if you know history, you will know that empires do not explode. Empires implode. And the reason why empires implode is because they spend more than they have on trying to defend read attack who they are and if you just question safety and security you will be labeled unpatriotic you can commit the most grave of sins in the name of safety and security listening to the presidential debates, if you could call them that. President Obama was asked, what is the greatest threat to America? Notice, notice please, the very narrow nationalistic question that is. His answer, terrorism and China. I want to say to Barack Obama, the greatest threat to America is not terrorism, it's not China. The greatest threat to America is America. You are your worst enemy. No one will explode you, you will implode.
If God fails using violence, so will the USA. God is a nonviolent God. Now, a couple of years ago, in my country, there was a, a murder that took place. And it was discovered that it was a family murder. An 18 year old killed her 13 year old sister, stabbed her repeatedly. The mother, as you can imagine, grieved like only a mother can grieve. And yet at the same time that she was grieving the loss of her daughter, she stood in solidarity with her other daughter, as only you can imagine a mother could do. She was reported to have said, I want to hate her, but I can't. She went to court every day when her daughter was in trial. She stood behind her and embraced her when she was convicted. She visited her daughter every available opportunity in prison, and when her daughter was finally released, she welcomed her home. Mrs. De Toy, the mother, found herself in the painful yet privileged position of God. Being parent to both murdered and murderer at one and the same time. I want to hate her, but I can't. I'm her mother. God is not only a nonviolent God, but God is the heavenly parent of both murdered and murderer. And to take vengeance on the murderer is simply to multiply the grief of God. If someone had come up to that mother and said, let us kill this daughter, she would say, no, don't double my grief. Not only is this a nonviolent God, not only does this God grieve on all sides of the border, but when we remember Saul traveling on the road to Damascus because he had written permission to extend his war on terror, he is stopped in his tracks with these words from the divine, why, why, why are you persecuting me? Please notice what the divine did not say. The divine did not say, why are you persecuting them? But why are you persecuting me? The divine takes persecution personally. It's not why are you persecuting the Afghans and the Iraqis and the Pakistanis and whoever else. No, why are you persecuting me? We need to hear that question here today. And so not only is God a nonviolent God, not only does God grieve on both sides, God takes persecution personally. Our violence violates God. All violence we see from that illustration is family violence. Cain and Abel were brothers. Did you know that death enters the Hebrew scriptures through murder? 
reminding us that all violence is family violence. That there are seven billion chosen, chosen people in the world. That the apartheid between nations must come to an end. If there's something that distresses me more than anything else every time I listen to the president of this country speak, when he ends his speeches with the words, God bless America. Someone please remind him that there is a world larger than America. And not until he begins to have a vision for the world and not just a nation. The only flag I am prepared to salute, the only flag, the only flag I'm prepared to stand up for is a flag with a picture of the globe on it. Can you give your flag away? And claim a new flag? And certainly remove it from your sanctuaries. Jesus said, if you wanna save your life, give it away. You want to save your nation, give it away. You want to save your flag, give it away. You want to save your religion, give it away. We know that it is easier to identify with the victim than the perpetrator. It's easier to see the splinter in our neighbor's eye than it is to see the log in our own eye. It is easier to watch a documentary called Pray the Devil Back to Hell. Than to face the devil in us and the hell that we create. I watched that documentary for the first time here, was deeply moved by it. The courage of woman. I was inspired when one of them said, with this t-shirt, I am powerful. I was horrified at the children, children carrying guns, that were too big for them to carry. I wept at the senseless suffering. But that was a distant devil to observe. Much more difficult to watch a documentary of the devil that we are and the hell that we create. Some people here have asked me, gosh, listening to Bernard Lafayette the other night, how is it possible to be able to draw that love from the wells that live within to be able to even love the person beating us? Now, it's a fine question to ask, but I think there is an earlier question you see, that question assumes we are going to be the victim. That question assumes we are going to be the one who is going to be beaten and kicked. But the, the balance of probability that any of us in the